Hello and welcome to this course on advanced robotics. My name is Professor Ashish Datta and I'm a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Kanpur. Now this course is a course in advanced robotics, so we'll go one step beyond the introduction to robotics. I'll cover the introduction to robotics part like uh, basic introduction, transformations, uh, basic control systems, forward inverse kinematics very quickly in the first few lectures. And then we'll move on to advanced topics like manipulation ability, then bipedal locomotion, design of systems, optimization as we go along. So this course is more focused towards research, students who are interested in doing research and for industrial uh, applications. Okay, so the title of the course is Advanced Robotics and my name is uh, Professor Ashish Datta. And the contents of the course I'll very briefly describe as we uh, before we start. The first is uh, this course consists of 12 weeks of lectures. Each a week will have about uh, two hours of lecture with one hour of, uh, with a half an hour of assignments. So we will start off the first week with introductions where I'll discuss about the introduction to robotics. For example, where did the word robot come from? What do we study in robotics and where is robotics progressing as we uh, from the past to the present to the future? Then we'll cover transformations. That is a robot basically moves in space. So we need to find what is the relation of the end effector or the gripper of the robot with respect to the base uh, of the robotic system. So after the first week, we'll move on to the second week, which is uh, where we'll cover DH parameters, then with Hartenberg parameters, where we'll explain how do you assign frames to an axis and then how do you do the forward kinematics, inverse kinematics. So week three is uh, forward inverse kinematics and redundancy resolution. Week four is velocity kinematics and Jacobian. That is, what is the relationship between the velocity of the end effector of the robot with respect to the joint velocities that is uh, given in terms of the Jacobian matrix. Then we'll look at advanced topics like singular value decomposition, singularity and manipulation ability. So singular value decomposition basically gives us the, uh, uh, the directions of the manipulation ability ellipsoid, which indicates which directions can you move very easily in space and in which directions you cannot move easily in space. This will be followed by trajectory planning and uh, dynamics. This is uh, week number six. Then we'll discuss about sensors and actuators as used in robotics. So after sensors and actuators, we'll move on to basics of linear control, where we'll talk about PD control, PID control. Okay, how do you uh, decide what should be the gain of a PD control or a PID controller? Then we'll talk about stability. Uh, stability is very, very important because whenever we want to discuss or we design a robotic system or a controller, it has to be stable. So what do we mean by stability? Okay, so here basically we'll be talking about the uh, stability in terms of the Lyapunov uh, method of, of determining stabilities. Now that will be followed by applications. So 9, 10, 11, 12 are basically applications or research applications, multi-finger grasping, what is form closure, force closure, grasp matrix. So when an object is being held by a multi-finger hand and you're moving the object around in that case, uh, what is the relationship between the object velocity and the fingertip velocities? That is given by the grass matrix. And then when we are saying that you are grasping an object, okay, so the object is in closure, what does this mean? So we define this in terms of form closure and uh, force closures. What is the mathematics behind this? We will explain. Then we'll move on to locomotion. This is a topic of interest uh, as it is becoming very, 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 very popular. Bipedal locomotion, quadrupeds and uh, bipeds so we'll talk about locomotion the kind of walkers that are there for example active uh, walkers passive walkers the concept of balance so when you're talking about a locomotion system like a quadruped on four legs or a hexaped on six legs we have to talk about balance because the system has to move forward and the system shouldn't fall down and hence it must be balanced okay then we'll talk about biped uh, biped get and balance using zero moment point kinematics and dynamics of uh, uh, modeling of walk so this focus would be on bipedal locomotion. So we have a bipedal system which is walking on flat ground or climbing stairs or in 3D terrain. Then how do you do the dynamics of such systems? How do you do the modeling? How do you do the simulation? Then uh, number 12, the week number 12 will deal with design and optimization of Leggett mechanisms. Because here we always talk about energy optimal. Okay. So uh, these systems are redundant, which basically means that uh, for example, if you think about walking, you can walk in different ways, but then we all tend to follow the same type of gait, which means that we have uh, evolved such that we are using energy optimal gates. So what is this energy optimality and how do you get optimal energy gates? 
that is something we'll discuss about in uh, week number 12. Okay, so this is the basic outline of the course uh, schedule which consists of 12 week of lectures and assignments. Now the course plan is that we'll be having weekly lectures. Okay, so we have uh, two lectures or three lectures per week and there'll be a tutorial or a problem solving assignment. Okay, so there is going to be a uh, problem solving uh, session for about half an hour. Then the lectures will be followed by one assignment each week. Now you're supposed to solve the problems in the assignment. So there'll be questions uh, given after each uh, in each every week. And then you're supposed to answer the questions in the assignments. Okay, based on which you'll be graded. And then at the end of the course, you'll be getting a particular grade. The reference books that are used for uh, this course would be Robot Dynamics and Control by Mark W. Spong and M. Vidya Sagar. This is published by Willy. The second book is Foundations of Robotics by uh, T. Yoshikawa. This is by PH, PHI India. And the third book is uh, Advanced Robotics, Redundancy and Optimization by Y. Nakamura. This is uh, Edison Wesley Publications. This book is no more in print, okay, but is a very, very good book for research. Now, those of you who have not taken any course in robotics, uh, I would uh, encourage you or advise you to look at an uh, introductory book. There is a book, Introduction to Robotics. Uh, Introduction to Robotics by Craig. Uh, by John Craig. Okay, this is published by Pearson. Okay, so for the very basics of robotics, those of you who have not studied the course, I would encourage you to look at this textbook. So I will be covering this very quickly in the first uh, couple of lectures and then I'll move on to more advanced topics. So uh, those of you who are just uh, starting to study robotics, please uh, get a copy of this book uh, and it's very helpful either to take a course or uh, to do research. Okay, so we start off with the first week's uh, lecture which is introduction to robotics where we'll talk about the past, present and the future of uh, robotics. Okay. Now. Uh, what is very interesting about this is that the word robot has become very very popular okay it is not only that people in engineering study robotics or they are interested in robots if you ask a general person on the street also or if you go to the village and ask uh, that have you heard about a robot so most probably or in all certainty the person is going to give you some idea or the person will say that yes i know that this is a robot or i think this is what a robot is okay so very rarely would you meet somebody who really has never heard of the word robot this also indicates the level to which robotics has uh, permeated into our society, not only in engineering and industry. Okay, so this is an interesting question that what comes to your mind when you first hear the word or think of a robot? Now it's interesting. Why? Because different people will give you different answers. Okay, so if you ask a kid, he'll say probably uh, it's, a, it's a pet or a toy. Okay, if you go to the shopping malls, you'll find that there are these top robotic kits, make yourself robotic kits. They're basically for kids. So they can be looked upon as kids, uh, kids' toys, okay? If you ask uh, an older person, they might say they're mechanical machines to do dangerous work in industries. This is the conventional definition of a robot. So a robot was made to do dangerous jobs in industries. If you go to uh, more advanced countries and uh, people who'd like to see a lot of movies, they might say the robot is a companion, it's a friend, okay, which is... You, they might even say that robots are helpers, which are going to help in uh, society or maybe helping uh, in your house in terms of security. And uh, nowadays, there is a lot of news on uh, in newspapers and in television, which says that robots, such as unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, these are for dangerous machines, which are used in warfare. So you can see that robots range from, or started off as mechanical machines in industries to do, to do dirty jobs. And then they have graduated and permeated into industry, into society today in the form of companions, friends, toys, helpers, and in defense uh, applications uh, as dangerous machines. So you can see the range to which robotics has moved, right from industry to society to warfare to outer space everywhere. These are some examples. This is an example of uh, a robot uh, which is uh, made in the form of a human being to basically guide kids or to help a teacher in kindergarten. This, these are robots which move around and uh, can assist in the homes in terms of security, in terms of, in terms of uh, communication with people. These are uh, robots which are trying to study human behavior 
robots trying to learn how to dance or teach how to dance. So these are the various areas in robotic where robotics has uh, permeated. Now, you might be thinking that uh, you have nothing to do with robots, right? That uh, robotics is in industries or in society or in movies. What do I have to do in robots? So I'll try and convince you that you actually have something to do with robots and we are all connected to robots in some way. Now, when we say robot, I don't essentially mean a hard hardware machine like the one you see here. Okay. Now, so this is the first robots, what we say, or the past, present and future. So this is the past where robots first started off with about 1960s. So robots were made to do dangerous uh, jobs in industries. And today also majority of the robots are actually doing tasks in automobile industry and electronic industry for assembly, spot welding, spray painting. So this is a robot. These are robots which are doing spot welding on, on a vehicle a chassis okay, in the automobile industry. So all the automobile industries, uh, wherever you are in India or abroad, the spot welding is done by robots because they are faster, they are more precise and they are safer. This is where robotics started off, 1960s. So this is the past of uh, robotics. Now, when we move on from there, we come to the next stage that is the present. The present would mean somewhere around the year 2000, okay, or a little bit later than this. And the best example is Amazon. So I was saying that you may think that you have nothing to do with robots, but if you just think a little bit, a robot is connected to your life in some way. You would have ordered a part in Amazon. So this basically, is a video of showing how Amazon works. So when you place your order uh, on the website in Amazon, the order goes to the warehouse and the part or the product that you have ordered is actually picked up from a particular shelf in the warehouse. And this is done automatically. There are no human beings there. Okay, you can see that there are thousands of these pods uh, and uh, this mobile robots go and pick up a particular pod in which your product is, brings it to the delivery part and in the delivery part, the person would probably put it into the box and then it's sent to you. So this involves a warehousing and this is the present state of uh, automation in uh, warehousing today. Okay, And the best example, of course, is Amazon. Now, there are how many robots? Well, there are thousands of robots, maybe three to four thousand robots which are operating in the warehouse. Now, this is not very easy in terms of uh, in terms of motion planning. For example, the robots have to move from one point to another point. There are thousands of robots. They have to move optimally, so they take the least amount of time. They shouldn't hit against each other okay, in terms of safety. So this is actually a very complex problem in motion planning. Okay, So you can see the robots moving around, not hitting each other in the fastest and the best possible way. So this is the present of robotics, where we are in terms of uh, uh, the past, the present. So the present is warehousing robotics, social robotics. The future is social robotics, where robots are supposed to come into the future and live in society. Okay. Robots are already there in airports, in railway stations, in schools, okay, in, as guides, in museums. So these are robots which are actually coming into society and are living with us in society. And we are talking of a lot of uh, new terms like clones is one. So this is an example where a person has made a clone of himself. Okay. And this behaves exactly like him, the facial expression. So it's difficult to say which is the real person, which is the clone. Okay. So this is the future of robotics, where robotics is getting embedded really in society in different ways. Now, this would also mean that there are a lot of new, new topics and uh, research issues in robotics. For example, safety is an issue. Okay, Safe robotics. How would you make a robot safe? How would you make a robot intelligent? Okay. We, we will uh, we talk also of AI in robotics. Okay, what is this AI in robotics? What is intelligent robotics? Okay, these are some things that we look at. Then uh, safety I just mentioned. The other is behavior, human-like behavior. So human-like behavior. How can a robot behave like a human? Okay, why, why is it required? Why are these things required? Why is safety required? Because in the industries, they are not required. The robot stays inside a cage. But once a robot comes and lives in society, you have to ensure these parameters, okay, that it is safe, it has some amount of intelligence, it behaves like a human, it looks like a human. It's very strange to say it should look like a human. Okay? It should not look scary. It should look like a human because we feel more comfortable when the robot is uh, having a feature like a human. Okay, So these are new topics that have come up, new areas of research that have come up. So I'm basically trying to explain that where robots came from, uh, where robots, uh, the past of robotics. So past of robotics is basically industrial robotics, okay, 1960s. It is there 
even today 80 percent of robots are used in automobile industry and in electronic industry so automobile for spot welding spray painting assembly automobile and electronics so all our electronic components like mobile phones televisions laptops uh, pcs okay everything is assembled by robots okay it's not done by humans so 80 percent of that goes there, uh, into uh, robotics or robotics applications are 80 percent in assembly of automobiles and uh, in electronics then the present uh, we are in the present where we are talking about online shopping and automatic warehousing like amazon flipkart where they use extensive large amount of robots for storing automatic retrieval and for delivery now today we talk also of delivery by using robots for example pizza delivery by uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that is of course a little far-fetched but that is the direction which we are going future social robotics robots which are going to come and stay in future with us robots in education this is another future uh, this is also the future and in some places it is already there in many countries where in countries like scandinavian countries in japan germany where they have a shortage of teachers in kindergarten uh, in and schools they are trying to use robots uh, to assist teachers if not to teach directly okay so robots in education this is a new area which has come in and a lot of robots are there already in the market which are targeted towards this education of uh, then we have home helpers helpers like alexa okay alexa google assistant okay these are all robots which are there which are already living in society okay okay so i was trying to explain uh, where robots has come from where we are at present and where we are going now the direction in which it is going has raised a lot of other questions for example which sounds very crazy but uh, if you just think about it it's uh, it's very funny that if you were to buy a robot or if there is a social robot which is living in society then what will, whether it will be a male it should be a female or it should be it should be neutral what should be the gender of the robot sounds a crazy question it's like asking what is the gender of a machine okay but then this is a very relevant question today that uh, what should be the appearance of the robot which is living in society for example if it is speaking in a voice okay then what should be should it be male should it be female okay what should be the voice uh, which for example the laptop can speak to you okay so what should be the voice then uh, what laws should be applicable to robots interacting with humans for example if there is an accident then who is responsible okay so this and this basically gives you an idea that robotics is not only confined to engineers today okay it has been it has permeated society in such a way that it's not only the engineers who are looking at robot robotics they are piece, uh, persons in uh, sociology who are looking at the effect of robots on society in different forms okay then there are people in human in uh, legal who are looking at the laws people in humanities people in languages okay who are looking at uh, for example when the robot is speaking to you what language it should use how can a robot understand english properly okay. so robotics has permeated almost all other domains not only engineering okay now before we move on to a more formal study i'll just like to explain or just give you a brief introduction of automation now robotics is a sub branch of the larger branch which is called automation now these are terms which we use very commonly sometimes not worrying too much about uh, what they mean for example automation what does automation actually mean if you say we hear industrial automation office automation home automation what does it mean so automation essentially means replacing human muscular power this is the definition of automation okay so if you are replacing muscular power of human beings by uh, by using a machine or by using a device you can call it automation and this business of automation has been going on for a very long time right from 10000 bc where human beings made stone tools for example we had stone tools then we had iron tools then copper tools in that order okay so this business of replacing human muscular power or making life easier has been going on for thousands of years right from 10000 bc and even today so tools make better tools okay. so from an nc machine from a normal lathe machine you have an nc machine from an nc you have a cnc machine from a cnc machine you can have a dnc machine then you have fms okay and then you can have sim so these are machines which are making better machines so it's like tools making better tools and this whole process is called automation now 
There are many examples of automation. For example, the design of simple automation in 150 BC, like moving engine, Heron's door. This is an example. So this is the first example of the steam engine somewhere on 150 BC. Okay. Now how this works is very interesting that there is a bucket of water or a container of water. And there are two pipes which are coming up like this and there is a sphere. And the sphere has two outlets in two directions. So when you boil water, what would happen is it will produce steam and the steam will come out in this direction and this direction. And because of this, uh, the directions in which the steam is coming out, there is going to be a resultant moment about that axis. So if there is a moment about that axis, this sphere will start rotating. So this is the earliest example of a steam engine. And if you look at the date, it's 150 BC. So it is not like the steam engine is something very recent, uh, invented in 1800 or something. Uh, this has been around for hundreds of years. Another example is Heron's door. Exactly automatic opening and closing of a door by, they would light fire. And if you light fire, what would happen? The pressure in, in this container would increase. If the pressure here increases, it will force the water down and it will come into the bucket. Once the water gets into the bucket, the force, downward force will increase and this is going to rotate in that direction. And what will happen? The door will open. Now, if you put up the fire, the pressure will decrease, the water will go back and uh, this one will come down now and it will the door will close. So this is automatic opening and closing of doors by lighting fire. Okay, so this is again automatic because there is no human intervention. So these are examples of uh, the earliest examples of automation, which was around from a very long time. So 19, uh, 1780 saw the creation of automatic dolls, which can write, draw pictures. Then we have uh, in 1801, this gentleman, James Jacquard in France, invented the uh, power loom. Okay, so this is the power loom or the textile uh, loom, which we have even today. So this is made... This is uh, used for making textiles. Even today, we use it. Now, you must have seen this in uh, TVs or uh, or in movies, or you must have might have seen one yourself uh, in a physical form. How it does is there is uh, the weaver basically passes thread uh, layers of thread like this, and when he or she wants to make a design, what they do is they take a color thread and they change the uh, position of the color thread, and hence creating a design. Right? That's how. A particular design is made on a textile or cloth and how this uh, direction of this thread is changed it is changed by pulling a lever but, so this is the thread which is coming down to make the designs so the position of this is changed by hand and you get different designs on cloth this is how we uh, we weave okay this is basically how we weave uh, textile okay now this gentleman james jacquard what he did is he made a, a machine and he embedded this uh, in the form of a program in, in a punch card so this is a punch card and what he did is this design basically he embedded in the form of a punch card in this punch card there are circles like that which is something very similar to the uh, omr sheets that you get today i'm sure you would have uh, used omr sheets where there are holes and either you'd color a hole make it black or you leave it white okay so multiple choice questions for example there is a multiple cho choice in a question and then you, whichever question you want to tick, you just uh, color that hole. Now the OMR reader, the card reader can actually read this. So it's basically zero or one. Okay, so it's basically if this is all zeros, means there is no black, this is one. So there is uh, one here. Okay, so it's binary. Each of this can be one or it can be zero. And that is read by a card reader. And based on that, this position of the thread is changed automatically by the machine. So this is the earliest example of a punch card system and the early computers also use punch cards where the programs were written in the form. Nowadays NC machines also use the M codes which are written on a NC machine. They are also written in this form. And so this is the father of the uh, punch card system and the early computers also used exactly the same way of programming. So this is a program textile loom for weaving cloth. Okay, 1801. Now, from there, if you pers proceed further, uh, 1901 or 1904, Henry Ford in the Ford Motor Company invented transfer lines. Now, what are these transfer lines? I'm sure you would have seen transfer lines if mo in movies or you might have seen them in industries, in automobile industries. So, how this transfer line works is that the body of the car is kept onto the transfer line and it's like a conveyor and this conveyor moves 
So at every location, the car comes and stops and something is done on the car. For example, it could be spot welded that I had just shown or you fix a tire okay, or you fix the glass or you fix a door. Okay, So it goes to various stations and it stops. So this is basically what is called a transfer line. So the car body is kept on a conveyor and it moves from one position to another position where different things are assembled or tasks are done. And this came about in 1904 in the Ford Motor Company. It is used even today. Now this is what we call hard automation where they use alignment devices, transfer devices, no robots. Okay. Of course there are no robots in 1904. Now just for historical sake and just for history, 1921 Karl Kapek first used the word robot in his play where he said uh, in this uh, play he depicted human-like mechanical men to do dirty jobs in industries. So this is apparently a picture from his uh, or a photo from his uh, play in which uh, he said that in future there will be this kind of mechanical men who will do the dirty job of people in industries and he used the word robot or robota for the first time and so this word the word robot actually comes from a Czechoslovakian language which means mechanical men okay so this is historically where the word robot came from of course there are no robots at that time this is 1921 1942 Isaac Asimov first used the word robotics and he said that in future there will be a subject called robotics okay so he talked about a subject called robotics and he also talked about the three laws of robotics those of you uh, who like to see science fiction or like to read uh, science fiction books there are a lot of robots a lot of uh, movies a lot of science fiction books i robot is one very interesting movie you can have a look at that okay so these are all this is essentially to show you where the word robot came from and where the word robotics came from. Of course, 1942 also, there is no robot. Okay. This is science fiction. Okay. Now, where did the robot come from? So about 1945, during the Second World War, uh, while making the, the atom bomb, they, have to hand, they had to handle radioactive material. And to handle radioactive material, as human beings could not go near, they had to make some kind of a mechanical device which can operate at a distance. So that is where the concept of master-slave manipulator came up. So what would happen is they would place the slave inside the hot cell. So suppose you want to handle something here. There would be very heavy shielding or very thick wall between with a very small window with a, which is liquid filled. And this would be very thick, maybe about five, about uh, three to five meters thick wall. So the radiation from this side cannot go on to the other side. And the master will stand here. Okay, so the master will stand here and operate the master site. So the operator or the master would stand and hold the master's master arm and move it. So if he pulls it this side or pushes it that side, what would happen is the slave will exactly do the same motion. How is the motion transmitted? As you can see that there are wire ropes and pulleys. So there is a wire rope which is connecting through like this to every joint and is going through pulleys. So if you pull it this side, what will happen? The tension there will change. And if the tension here changes, then the tension on the other side changes and this arm moves up or it moves down or rotates. Okay, So something to note here is that this is very strictly a mechanical device. There is no electronics here. There is no sensors, actuators, controllers. And motion is transferred by means of wire ropes and pulleys. Okay. So this is a mechanical device. It is used even today in uh, atomic energy establishments in uh, power, nuclear power stations where they have to handle material at a distance. Okay, and this is called a master slave manipulator. This is also the father of the robot that came about in 1945. Now, this is strictly a mechanical device. Now, something was invented around 1948-49 because of which mechanical systems became electromechanical or we say mechatronics. Okay, so we have uh, the concept of program coming in. And now with a program, you could change how a device is going to behave. Or, and what was invented was the transistor. 1949 and with the transistor came the concept of reprogram okay. so from the transistor we had the computer and uh, from the computer we had the microcomputer then uh, microcontrollers dsps in that order so with the invention of the transistor came the concept of reprogram now you could write a program to control a device and if you change the program then the device would behave differently okay this was not possible before that so everything after 1949 became mechanical became electromechanical and there was a combination of uh, mechanical and electronics coming together okay 
and so 1945 the first robot was made which was called Shiki. So this is a mobile robot which is basically uh, having two wheels and a caster wheel as a support. It could move around, do obstacle avoidance. So it can do obstacle uh, avoidance. Okay, And uh, it was a very simple robot which could simply move around the room and uh, avoid obstacles. And this is the first robot, a mobile robot, which was made in Stanford. So in Stanford University, 1950, Shaky, the first robot was made. 1952, George Dowell, teach and playback devices for NC machines. So NC machines or numerical control machines and robots are essentially the same. They're the same technology. Numerical control means, NC means numerical control. Okay, so numerical control uh, machines. So numerical control means control by numbers. Now in a robot also you control a robot by numbers. So for example, if you have a robot here, a robot to go to some point, okay, then what we do is I give the x, y, z coordinates. So it goes from this point to maybe this point. So this is x dash, y dash, z dash. So I want it to go from here to here. So we are trying to control it using numbers. Okay, so both of them are under the same technology or numerical technology. So the first major revolution that came about is the invention of the transistor. Okay, that changed uh, technology in a very, very big way. We look at another two changes that came, uh, which really changed the way uh, engineering was and in the area of robotics. So first of all, if you look at robotics, it has moved from 1950 to the year 2000 or 2022 now. Now it has moved from a very simple robot, a mobile robot to a very complex robot, which has like very high 54 degrees of freedom. It can walk, it can run, it can, it has uh, some amount of vision. It can, uh, it can speak. Okay, it has voice recognition, it can climb stairs, it can do obstacle avoidance. Okay, so this is a very, very complicated system okay, compared to this one. So we have moved in just 50 years from here to there. And the invention of this is because of the transistor. Now there were two more changes that happened. Uh, the second revolution, the third revolution, because of which we moved from here to here. Now it's important for us to know what changes came so that we can predict what changes are likely to come in the future. Okay. Now, as the computer became more and more powerful, we had the computer becoming more powerful so that one machine in the earlier days, one machine or one computer, okay, so we can call this as a computer. So one computer was controlling one machine in the early days, 1960s. As the computer became more powerful, we have one computer controlling many machines. The computer is becoming smaller and is becoming more powerful. So we have NC, then we have CNC, okay? And from after CNC, we have DNC in that order, okay? So we have NC, CNC, then we have uh, FMS. So after FMS, we have computer integrated manufacturing, okay, where the computer has become so powerful that it is integrating the other manufacturing activities like, uh, for example, material resource planning, planning, execution, Okay, so what we are seeing is that the computer is essentially becoming more and more powerful. So one machine, one computer, one computer, many machines. Then we move on to one computer controlling different kinds of machines. So this is a flexible manufacturing system in which there are multiple machines or different kinds of machines which are being controlled by the uh, single computer. Then we have computer integrated manufacturing where almost all activities of the manufacturing industry are controlled by one computer only. This is another term which we use, Industry 4.0. Now, we have different industrials, uh, Industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0. So basically, 1.0 means mechan where the power, the driving power. So how this division comes in is based on the driving power. So driving power. So in the case of Industry 1.0, the driving power is water power or steam power. Okay, this is early days uh, before about 1800. Okay. So you can see that uh, in, the, in such industries, the driving power or the driving energy was basically water power, steam power was used to drive machines. In the second uh, industry 2.0, uh, what we had mass production, assembly lines, the driving power was electricity. So this is after 1800. Okay. So mass production of vehicles, for example, assembly lines, which came about for automobile industry. This is all the, what we talk about the industrial revolution in England and the driving power was electricity there. 
Then we had the third industry 3.0 where we have computer and automation. So this is automation again, but driven or controlled by computers. And we say this is industry 3.0. Okay. And uh, uh, this is about 1970s. In India, we talk about this as the IT revolution. So here, if you note, we have automation, well, means automatic machines, robots, transfer lines, and there are computers which are controlling that, but there are no humans. Now, what is the difference between the third and the fourth? Essentially, in the fourth revolution, we have computers, automation, but these are interconnected with humans also. Okay, that is the fundamental difference. And here we can say, we can call it cyber physical system. We can see industry 4.0. So this connection involves machines, humans, and AI, some kind of intelligence. And this is what we mean by uh, the fourth or industry 4.0 today. So fundamentally, it's computers, automation, and there are many examples. For example, Uber cabs, Ola cabs, your, uh, your Swiggy, and there are so many other examples where we are using cyber physical systems. So there is a human, there is a machine, and there is some kind of AI or uh, virtual reality which is going on. Okay. Now, what is the definition of a robot? Now, this is interesting that nobody seems to agree. Okay. But uh, we do agree that to be called a robot, the system should be able to do some or all of the following. Okay. For example, the system should be able to move around. Then the system should be able to sense and manipulate the environment. Move around is very clear. The robot is moving around. A uh, mobile robot moves around. A serial arm, the arm moves around. So it moves around. Sense and manipulate the environment. There should be some kind of sensors, which is, uh, for example, obstacle avoidance. Okay. So this is fine. This is easy to understand. Third is it should in display some kind of intelligent behavior. Okay. Now, this is not very easy to answer because if you say intelligent behavior, then what is intelligent? Okay, so to be called a robot, a system should be able to do some or all of the following. For example, a wheelchair, okay, which is which can autonomously move around, can be called a robot. Why? Because it moves around, it can sense and uh, avoid obstacles, so it can it can sense and manipulate the environment. It can display some kind of intelligent behavior that it, it can find the path in the shortest time, find the shortest path in that sense. Okay, so in that definition. If you think about a CNC machine and a robot, is a CNC machine a robot? Well, a CNC machine is not a robot. Why? Because it does not move around, first of all. It doesn't sense and manipulate the environment, and it does not display intelligent behavior. It's a machine tool. Okay. Whereas a, uh, so, we cannot, so a CNC machine is basically a machine tool. Okay. And it's not a robot, because it does not satisfy any of these three conditions. So it seems uh, easy to classify something as a robot or not a robot based on these three uh, rules okay so an uh, automatic vacuum cleaner is that a robot yeah automatic vacuum cleaner is a robot because uh, it can move around the room avoid obstacles do the cleaning in a particular time and it can have some kind of path planning okay so it satisfies uh, two or three of these uh, requirements so automatic vacuum cleaner is a robot now uh, when we talk about robotics and automation these are again terms which we use. So robotics focuses on systems incorporating sensors, actuators that operate autonomously, okay, or semi-autonomously in cooperation with humans, okay. So we are worrying about systems incorporating sensors and actuators that operate autonomously. Now, in terms of automation, what automation basically means is in automation study and research. We are emph emphasizing efficiency, productivity, quality, and, reliab and reliability, basically. Now, what, what does this basically mean? So in automation, for example, if I have a transfer line uh, where we have a conveyor and there is parts which are coming, I can put many robots here to do some tasks. So I'm going to place different robots here okay, to do tasks. So these are robots which are placed, robotic arms. So in automation, what we'll see, what we'll study is, for example, how many robots should be there? where the robot should be placed, what is what should be the cycle times. So we are not actually studying the robot. We are just looking at the application and trying to optimize uh, things like efficiency, productivity, quality. And that study is basically all automation. Whereas if you are studying robotics in terms of sensors, actuators, controllers, which are operating autonomously, then we say it is robotics. Okay, so there is a difference between the two. Now, uh, 
the complete gamut of robotics can be divided into three or four generations. First generation of robots, these are simple click and place devices with no external sensors. So this is very early, about 1960s. Then we have second generation robots where there are external sensors like vision, tactile, and they can interact with the environment. This is about 1980s. Okay. And then we have third generation robots which are intelligent, smart, uh, made of smart materials or bio robots. These are about 2000. Okay. And then the future robots, we have so many like uh, bio robots, micro robots, nano robots, cyborgs, androids and whatnot. Okay, this is the future, so 2000 onwards. Okay, so these are the generations in which we divide uh, robotics. Now, the first generation or the first industrial uh, major change that came through, okay, was because of the transistor. Okay, the generation of the, the invention of the computer and then the creation of the robot. The second generation or the second great industrial uh, change that came about or technological change was that electronics became smaller, faster, and cheaper. Okay, so this is about 1970s. And what caused it was VLSI, very large scale integrated circuits. So before 1970s, before VLSI, a computer was very, very big in size. It had all these diodes, diodes and consumed a lot of power, was expensive. Okay, but with VLSI, you could make everything or embed everything in one motherboard. And the computer suddenly became very small. And electronics became smaller, faster, and cheaper. And this we know that electronics is very small, fast, and cheap as of today. Okay, and that is essentially because of the second revolution, which is VLSI. And with uh, electronics becoming small, fast, and cheap, we had these new areas which have come up, which is like vision, computer vision, advanced sensors like gyros, inclination sensors, force talk sensors, advanced controllers like microcontrollers, DSP, speech recognition, AI. So all these studies came about because the computer became more readily available and it became cheaper, smaller, and faster. Okay, so this is from 1970 onwards. Now, uh, the third basic technological revolution that took place was the new materials. Okay. With the invention of uh, smart materials and smart actuators, okay, there was an interest in emulating biological designs, for example, designing robots which look like humans or behave like uh, biological animals, quadrupeds, flying robots. Okay. They also looked at new areas like micro, nano, uh, vision bio robots okay so this new materials enabled robotics to move from the macro domain to the micro domain what does that mean if you look at a basic control system this is my control system for a, a closed loop control system for a normal robot or an NC machine how does it work there is a controller there is an actuator which is a motor this is my work table on my link and there is a feedback which is an optical encoder so this is the sensor Okay, so how does it work? Suppose you want the robot, suppose you have, uh, let's take an example, you have one link robot here and theta is equal to maybe 10 degrees here and you want to move it to theta equal to 80 degrees. Okay, so you give the x value or let's say theta value, 80 I want to move it to 80. So what the controller does is it looks at the desired position which is 80, let's call it theta desired and it looks at the present position. So the feedback from here is the third it is at 10 degrees. So what the controller does is it takes 80 minus 10. So the desired position minus the actual position, which is 70, and then multiplies it with some uh, with an amplifier with some gain. Let's call this Kp, and then gives it to the motor. The motor rotates and this moves in that direction. Now as it is moving, the sensor is giving the sensory information that the link is moving. So this is increasing slowly. Now as it increases. What is happening is it becoming 80 minus uh, maybe 20, then 80 minus 30, 40, 50, as this is increasing, right? This one is increasing. Now, the moment it becomes it's going like this, stops. this is how a closed loop control system works. Now, if you want to make a micro or a nano robot, control or micro or nano robot, you can make this small. How small is small? Suppose it's less than one millimeter, less than 10 millimeters. Okay. Now, if you want to make something that small, what would happen is that uh, if, you, if you make a, a DC motor which is very small, say one millimeter, the DC motor will not work anymore. Okay, so this basically says, uh, or what we call the size effect, and it is that if you make an actuator very small, it will not work. So a DC motor cannot be used in micro nano uh, scale. So in order to move to the micro nano scale, you have to use actuators which can operate at that scale. And these are not DC motors, but they are basically made up of smart materials, smart actuators. As we go along, we'll explain. So this 
the invention of smart materials, smart actuators are what enabled us to move to the micro domain. Okay. Now, uh, there are other ways of classifying robots, for example, parallel robots, serial robots, mobile robots, stationary robot. Okay, these are just ways of classifying robots, industrial robots, social robots. Now, uh, what is the scale in which we are today? Now, the scale can be very, very small. We're in the scale of where we can actually go inside the bloodstream. So this is a, a very futuristic kind of micro robot. And it is so small that it has been put into the bloodstream. And it can go into the bloodstream and do a particular task in particular places. So that is how small we are talking about. And that is the scale where we are. Okay. This is a micro robotic surgery. This is already there. For example, uh, robotics bypass surgery, placement of stents in the hearts, in the blocked uh, arteries in the heart. For example, you can have a robot which is very small, which can go into the, heart, uh, into the arteries and then it can drill holes and uh, clear the blockage. Okay. We, so we are already at that scale. Uh, dentist cleaning teeth. Okay, very funny uh, example, but that is the scale in which we are. Uh, robotic haircut, automatic haircut is there in many places in the world. This is an example of a smart material based actuator, which I talked about. Okay. So this is a electroactive polymer, which is also an artificial muscle. So this is a hand made of an electroactive polymer. There are no links, there is no actuator sensor control anywhere which you can see. So there are no links here, right? So this is a hand without any linkages, without any joints, which is opening and closing. So this is made up of an electroactive polymer and simply by changing the voltage, you can change the way this uh, hand is opening and closing. So this is an example of a smart materials based actuator uh, in robotics. This is a bird. This is a snake. These are examples of smart materials based actuators. Exoskeletons, robots made for assisting humans, for carrying heavy weight or for going up and down stairs. Okay, so this, these are what we call wearable robots. Okay, so wearable robots are uh, basically robots that can be worn and can assist human beings in doing particular tasks. Okay, then these are just examples. Uh, recovery after stroke, autom autonomous transport. These are automatic transport buses which are, are, which are driverless. So they go to particular stopping points they stop there people get up get down they go to the next point so this is completely driverless and it's autonomous so this is a robot so we can call this a robot bus okay so we can call this a robot bus because it satisfies the definition of a robot then uh, things like uh, brain computer interfaces can we take the signal straight from the brain and then actuate a device okay because when you're moving your hands for example you're typing on the keyboard or you're using a joystick you're actually moving your hands but this moving of the hands is initiated in the brain in the brain by means of our eeg signal All right now if you can get the brain signal then i exactly can use it to actuate the the uh, the joystick okay because i know what you're thinking so there are some uh, devices which are already there on the market in the form of toys for example you can put on a headset uh, eeg headset this game is already there, a video game where there is a car which is moving. So this is a car which is moving and there are obstacles which are coming. So using the headset, you just put on this headset which has electrodes on your forehead and you have to think left or right and think left, right, left, right. So if you want to move it towards the right, then you have to think right, move towards the right. And just by thinking, the electrode picks up the signal and the car can move to the right. Okay, so this is uh, what we call brain computer interfaces where they can look at what you're thinking in terms of motion, left, right, okay, and then move a device. Uh, automatic road tracking, autonomous vehicles. This is a very great research issue today, very great industrial application today, autonomous driving, autonomous cars, okay. Uh, autonomous driver, driver tracking, if the, is the driver sleeping, is the driver uh, paying attention, okay. Then uh, robotics and AI. So we tend to use the word AI very, very commonly these days. Okay. So is there some fundamental difference between robotics and AI? Okay. This is, uh, this is something which I would just like to touch upon. This is not a part of uh, robotics, but uh, these are two different aspects actually. Okay. Now, uh, these are some examples. If you have seen these movies, uh, Star Wars, iRobot, I was talking about uh, iRobot in terms of uh, in, in the, when we are talking about Isaac Asimov, okay. Now, uh, so what is AI? 
or artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence basically deals with systems that think like humans and systems that act like humans. Okay, so robotics is a part of that in a way. Okay, so we are talking of robots uh, which try to think like humans or try to behave like humans when we talk about social robotics, for example. Okay, industrial robot may not be, but uh, when we're talking about social robotics, okay, then we do talk about uh, systems which think like humans and act like humans. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, basically, uh, AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. Okay, that is basically, and when we talk about intelligent machine, especially the focus is on intelligent computer programs. Okay, so a robot, sometimes in very short, also called a bot, okay, something like a chat bot, that's also a robot. So a robot can be a piece of hardware, like an industrial robot, or it can be a software, which is a bot, or a chat bot, that's also a robot. Okay, so AI basically deals with the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. Uh, okay, but then what is the definition of intelligence? So intelligence is the computational ability to achieve goals in the world. Okay. Beyond that, we still don't know what is the definition of intelligence. So fundamentally, robotics and automation are different. I bought, I just wanted to emphasize that robotics and AI are different. And AI basically deals with the act or the art of making, not art, the engineering of making intelligent machines or intelligent computer programs okay so there is some difference and there is some connection so uh, we should be careful when we're using these terms okay the best example uh, that we can think about is the google car or autonomous driving car okay so the car has to behave like a human so when we say that the art of uh, intelligence is the art as i just explained art of uh, systems that can think like humans and act like humans so in a driverless car, the car is actually behaving like there is a driver and the way a driver would actually drive a car. Okay, so in that way, uh, it is having some kind of intelligence. So autonomous car can be talked about as having some kind of uh, AI. Okay, so this is a robot in one sense. It's a robot having some AI in another sense. Okay, these are some examples of, uh, towards the end of the course, we'll be looking at applications like quadrupeds. Bipeds. So this is one of the most famous quadruped robots which have been made called Big Dog. You can look at uh, in YouTube. It is available. When the dog is walking, it is having a sequence of foot placements, which is called gait. Also, it is balanced. So it is going in all kinds of terrain and it is balanced when it is moving. Okay. So before we get that far, we have to look at transformations. We have to look at uh, how do we do the kinematics, dynamics of such systems. How do you find out the optimal trajectories. So when it is walking, the trajectory is energy optimal and it is balanced. Okay, so that is exactly what we're trying to do in this course. Towards the end, we'll come to this. This is what is stability. If there is an external disturbance, okay, somebody is uh, uh, not being very kind and kicking it, but there is an external disturbance, will the system fall down or the system will just uh, be able to balance again? So this is a stable system. So what do you mean by stability okay, of such systems? So when we talk of control systems, we'll talk about stability. This is another example uh, of a biped. So this is a biped robot which is walking. So you can see that uh, it is walking in very uh, difficult terrain like uh, snow, where even human beings would find it difficult to walk. And it doesn't fall down. So it needs to balance. I talked about zero moment point based balancing. It needs to be stable. It needs to have optimal gait, okay? Otherwise, it will immediately fall. Okay, this is more difficult than the quadruped because it's standing on two legs only, okay? So this is some things we'll be covering towards the end of the course that when we are analyzing such uh, systems uh, like quadrupeds, bipeds, how do we do the analysis? How do we do the kinematics? How do we do the dynamics? How do we do the planning, control, and? So uh, today we will uh, stop here. And uh, we'll move on in the next class onto joints and work volume. So a robot is made up of different joints, right? And so just just uh, to give you a very brief introduction before we stop today, uh, a robot is made up of links which are connected by joints. So these are what we call links, and these links are connected by joints. 
I'm going to assume that this is uh, this is fixed. Okay, this uh, this is fixed, and this is a fixed base, which means the robot is not moving. And this is the end, which is free. We can call this the end effector. Okay, so we have a robot which is made up of links. These links are connected by joints, and the joints are uh, fixed to the base of the robot, which is not moving, and the end effector is free, which is uh, moving around. And there is a controller, which can be a PC, which can be a microcontroller, which is actually controlling the robot. Okay. So we'll look at different kinds of joints, which are there. And with different joints, we can make different kinds of robots. So from here, we'll start off with the formal study. Today was just an introduction class. So we will stop here with the introduction and uh, move on next to... After joints, we'll move on to transformations that when the robot is actually moving uh, how do we get the relationship of the end effector with respect to the base of the uh, the fixed uh, system okay so we'll stop here today thank you